Okay, so this is lesson 11. We're still talking about your blood. This time we're going to focus on your white blood cells mostly because we'll be talking about immunity uh, and how your body, specifically your blood, can help protect you uh, against infection and disease. This is the last lesson uh, in the section on circulation. So before we talk about what your blood does, you have to be a bit aware of how you might get some kind of infection that's going to eventually stimulate your white blood cells to be produced in great number. I put an awesome picture at the top that I'll talk about in a second. The first word that I'd like to define is the word pathogen. A pathogen is a pretty generic term for a disease or infection causing organism in general. Now I'm using the word organism fairly loosely. Uh, because one of my examples is a virus, and viruses are not technically considered living. And I wanted to not use the word thing. It's a thing that causes diseases or infections. But a pathogen is some kind of structure, usually some kind of organism, that will cause a disease or an infection. Underneath, I'm giving a bunch of examples of things that could be pathogens. Some of them you would have heard of before. A virus, like the one that gives you chicken pox. Uh, HIV, the one that gives you, or the one that would cause AIDS. Now I put a little note next to HIV, what it actually does. And right now you're going to be like, what's a T cell? I have no idea what you're talking about. But we'll talk about what a T cell is. And I'll just mention again, that's what HIV is doing. It could be a bacteria, for example, the bacteria that causes tuberculosis or the one that causes cholera, both of which are not super common things to have in this day and age because there are immunizations against them. It could be some sort of fungi, which is the plural of fungus, like what causes athlete's foot. It could be a protozoan. A protozoan is a single-celled organism. It's kind of like a bacteria, but it is in a different classification. Uh, that's what causes malaria. It could be a type of worm. And this is where people start just doing this because it's gross. Uh, but there are different types of worms. There are actually so many types of worms that there are different classifications for worms based on if they are flat or round. An example of a flat worm condition uh, is what's called bilharzia or snail fever. Uh, this is a fairly common thing uh, in people where clean water is not accessible. So if you've ever seen, let's say, a picture of some children in a third world country where their stomach is extended, that's a fairly common symptom of having a flatworm uh, infection. Another type of worm would be a round worm. The difference between them is just as their name suggests. One of them looks flat, the other one looks round. Uh, that's what the picture is of up here. So if you look at the word, it looks like the word elephant with a little ending, so elephant elephantiasis. Uh, this is a condition that has to do with your skin and your lymph. Uh, I, I've mentioned lymph nodes a bunch of times. You have other vessels in your body that don't carry blood. They carry this lymph fluid around. Uh, and this person here has this condition where there's excessive accumulation of fluid and it makes especially the legs usually look puffed out. So these are a bunch of, bunch of examples of things that would cause an infection. Now how would you acquire one of these pathogens? Air is a really common method. Water is probably one of the number one ways that pathogens travel. A, because water moves, and so it's easy for the pathogen to get from one spot to the next. 
B, most pathogens are living organisms, which means they would require some amount of water for their survival. Usually if there's water uh, that's flowing, the temperature is more reasonable than if water was not flowing. So in general, living organisms prefer to be close to water. And if you think about the number of people on the planet that don't have access to clean water, that would be one of the reasons as well, because we need it. Food would be an example. So uh, a number of these things you hopefully wouldn't get from food, but you might be aware that you can get salmonella from eating raw, uncooked things. Uh, you could get one of the worms from eating raw, uncooked flour. That would be a thing that can happen. Uh, insects are a pretty common thing as well, because insects uh, generally bite things. And so you might be aware that one of the ways that malaria is transmitted isn't usually person-to-person -person contact, but moreover, insect-to-person -person contact, because now they have blood and they're biting you. Sexual transmission would be another one. That would be one of the common ways, for example, that HIV had been getting passed on. Some conditions, but not all of them, could just be from direct contact, like chickenpox. If you are in the vicinity and you touch someone with chickenpox and you haven't had it, there is a very high chance that you will have chickenpox as well. So these are just some of the things that can cause you to have an infection and the ways that they can be transmitted. Now, once you have an infection, or once your body recognizes that through air, water, insects, whatever, you have a pathogen somewhere, your body is going to respond. The thing that you need to recognize is that pathogens are what we would call foreign. They're not supposed to be in your body. And your body's job or your immune system's job is to try to pick out things that are foreign. When we talked about blood types, if a blood type that was not your own got introduced, that is why your body reacts and attacks it, because it thinks it is a foreign substance and your body is trying to get rid of it. So, what does your body do? Before your blood even really gets involved, you have several lines of defense against infection. The first line of defense that you have is your skin and your membranes, collectively, which we would call barriers. Now you might ask, what's the distinction between skin and a membrane? Skin is what covers the outer surface of your body, but you have membranes uh, for in most of the openings of your body, your nose, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, etc. There are membranes there that are not your skin, that are offering some kind of barrier or protection. In addition, or along with your skin and your membranes, you usually find these things mucus. Mucus would be especially evident uh, if you're talking about your respiratory system. Mucus covers the lining of that so that things cannot get in to your lungs as easily. You have acidity. A really good example is your stomach. Your stomach has acidity. Now there are other membranes that have acidity as well when we're talking about sexual transmission. Uh, there is acidity there to try to help stop the risk of infection. You have tears, so that would be for your eyes. So tears are a natural mechanism to try to wash away something that has gotten in your eye. And you have clots. So even if your skin or the barrier was broken, your body is set up to try to repair the hole in the barrier immediately so that some kind of pathogen could not get through. So, clots are made by a particular type of cell. The type of cell is a platelet, and its scientific name is a thrombocyte. That means a clot cell. So site means cell, and thrombo is talking about a clot. Now, why are they called platelets? That's kind of what they look like, little flat discs. They are produced in the bone marrow, just like red blood cells. And they are quite small. They're just little fragments of cells. And they have proteins 
in them that will help your blood to clot. Now, the mechanism of blood clotting is beyond the scope of our course. I put a couple of example names of blood clotting proteins there so that you could see thrombo. The prefix thrombo, anytime you see it, has to do with a clot. Uh, so we said in our previous section, a thrombosis is a clot. That can happen if you have atherosclerosis. A thrombocyte is the cell that is going to help produce the clot. Thromboplastin and thrombokinase are proteins that will do that. Now on the right here, there's just a little illustration of what is happening basically with a blood clot. The idea is that if you have a blood clot, a big clump will form. The clump will be platelets, uh, a tissue called fibrin, and some proteins that all sort of group together to block whatever hole or damage has been made in the blood vessel. So, your first defense against infection is your skin or the membranes and barriers that you have, including clots that could help repair damage to any of the barriers that you have. Anyone want to ask anything about clots? Uh, so we're still talking about how your body defends itself from infection. And the second thing that we'll talk about uh, is your white blood cells. Your white blood cells are called leukocytes. So just like all of the other blood cell words, the site part means cell and the leuco part means white. So your white blood cells, just like your red blood cells, are produced in your bone marrow. But there are other places that white blood cells go to uh, to develop and to mature. Now your white blood cells can also leave the blood vessels. So we would call this an open system compared to your red blood cells. Your white blood cells come in and out of your blood vessels through the walls of the capillaries. Now contrary to red blood cells, white blood cells have a nucleus, so that's different. Unlike your red blood cells, which have a pretty finite defined lifespan, your white blood cells have a really variable lifespan. It would be hard to pinpoint the lifespan of a white blood cell because it varies depending on what, for example, what types of pathogens they are exposed to. So some white blood cells will live much longer, some will live much shorter. Now we saw earlier that if we were to look at the composition of blood, there are way more red blood cells than there are white blood cells. The sort of average number is that maybe there's about one white blood cell for every 600 red blood cells. So the difference in numbers is quite vast. And that would be the ones that are actually in your blood. There might be other white blood cells doing something somewhere else, but in your blood, there are way more red blood cells. We've already seen this a number of times, but high white blood cell count generally means that your body is fighting some kind of infection. And so one of the ways that we could medically test to see if someone has an issue with their blood or an issue with an infection is to do a white blood cell count. And if you watch any sort of doctor shows, it's a term they refer to regularly. The white blood cell count is higher. The white blood cell count is low. Pus, maybe you might be interested to know, is actually destroyed white blood cells with a few other things mixed along with it. Now before we talk about the effect that they have, I just want to mention this little picture that's over here. 
there are a bunch of different types of white blood cells. And getting into the technicalities of each type of white blood cell would take us weeks. And so we're not going to do that. We're going to talk about white blood cells or leukocytes in general. And then we will mention a couple of the other types of white blood cells. But I just want you to be aware there are a bunch of types. They don't all look the same. And so when we say white blood cell, that's actually a fairly large category encompassing a bunch of different cells that have slightly different roles. So I'm just going to pause the video here. So leukocytes is the big major category. And underneath leukocytes are some other types of cells. If I don't mention it, you don't have to know the cell type. The first uh, effect that white blood cells have is what I'm going to call the direct effect. This means that your white blood cells will directly contact a pathogen and do something to it. The process that is happening is called phagocytosis. Does anybody know what this is already? You might remember science 10, endocytosis, there were two types, pinocytosis, phagocytosis. Maybe this is all just a mist in your memory. Phagocytosis is essentially this. This Pac-Man would represent a white blood cell. Specifically, this white blood cell is called a macrophage, but it's just one of the types of white blood cells. This type of white blood cell will locate a pathogen and will essentially consume it and destroy it. So, if I were to look at the result of this, My macrophage would sort of finish encompassing the other thing, the pathogen. The pathogen would end up inside of a vacuole or some sort of vesicle. Uh, and I showed a scribble to show that it would get decomposed. So there would be enzymes present that would help break down that cell. This is a direct effect, but it's fairly nonspecific. A macrophage isn't really caring what it's destroying. It's just like, not me, not me, not me. Oh, foreign, foreign, foreign. I'm just going to eat you. It's very non-specific. But it is direct because you can see it's directly destroying the pathogen. The indirect effect uh, is the idea of producing antibodies. We've already seen a little bit what an antibody is. And we'll talk about how antibodies are produced. Part of the indirect effect, so when a pathogen enters your body, is that aside from producing antibodies, uh, some of your white blood cells, called basophils, it's just another type, release histamine. Histamine is something you're probably familiar with in the sense of antihistamines. A histamine, uh, and I don't know why I can't make this show up a little bit better. I want this to go away. That was dumb. There we go. Uh, histamines are released by special white blood cells. They cause dilation and permeability of capillaries. So the idea is that a histamine is going to let more blood flow to the place that has been injured or damaged or is infected with a pathogen so that more of your white blood cells can mount an attack against it. So, if sometimes you are someone who has to take an antihistamine, it means that your body might be overly sensitive to something in the environment. So, a lot of people need antihistamines in the spring when there's pollen and dust in the air because those things trigger uh, an allergic type reaction. Uh, like you saw when you read the articles, an allergic reaction is really just your immune system responding to a perceived threat that might not be a threat at all, but it's your immune system responding. 
Now, when we talk about the indirect effect, that's all I have to say about histamines. What we will focus on is how antibodies are produced. So before I go ahead, I'll just stop and see if anybody has any questions that they want to ask about white blood cells, about phagocytosis, maybe about the production of antibodies. So, we're talking about white blood cells. We've mentioned a couple. I mentioned a basophil and a phagocyte. We are going to focus on this little section of white blood cells. They're called lymphocytes because they're in your lymph. So I need to tell you what is your lymphatic system. You need to be aware of what this is. In your body, aside from blood vessels, you have a bunch of other accessory vessels. So the key thing here, they are not blood vessels. They're not arteries, they're not veins, they're not capillaries. They're vessels. A vessel is simply the method of transportation uh, for a substance. These accessory vessels run throughout your whole body. So basically, anywhere you have blood vessels, you also have lymph vessels. And they empty into the superior vena cava. That means that the contents of your lymph can go into your blood and vice versa. Now, your lymphatic system is made up of the vessels. It's made up of nodes. These are collection areas. Their job is to try to clean the lymph. That would be why they get really inflamed when you have an infection. Now, some of the lymph nodes I've highlighted over here, cervical nodes, so the ones that are in your neck, which are the ones usually that the doctor would feel. You have axillary nodes that are kind of in your armpit. Uh, you have nodes down here, sort of in the groin area. And then there are vessels that are connecting all of these nodes together. Uh, for most of the nodes, you have one on both sides. So you have two cervical nodes, one under each arm, one in each groin area. You have the lymph, which is the fluid. So your blood is made up of a bunch of fluid, so is your lymph. You have your spleen which plays a role in cleaning your blood. It also plays a role, you might remember, in breaking down red blood cells. Your spleen is sort of over here. Now, where is that in reference to everything else? It's kind of right beneath your diaphragm, position-wise. And then you have your thymus gland. Your thymus gland is up here in your chest, sort of in the area in between where your lungs are, just beside where your heart is. The thymus gland uh, is a place where some of the cells mature. So some of these white blood cells, even though they're produced in your bone marrow, aren't ready to go yet. They still need to do some developing, and the thymus is a place where that can happen. So that is your lymphatic system. Now, I said the type of white blood cells that we're going to focus on are called lymphocytes because they're in your lymph. Uh, and so we're going to focus on a few types of white blood cells that specifically mature in your lymph or exist in your lymph most of the time. You'll notice this is the second time I've mentioned a T cell. Uh, that is a lymphocyte. And we're going to make a list of what they all are. Does anyone have anything they want to ask here? So, we're talking about lymphocytes. If I look at the word, these are lymph cells, cells that are in your lymph. They are a type of white blood cell. So, Lymphocyte and leukocyte do not mean the same thing. A leukocyte is any white blood cell. A lymphocyte is a type. And there are five of them. 
Now what we're going to do is be fairly general about what each of these five are doing so that you have an idea of sort of how they would work together. What I'll do is tell you what each cell does and then make a bit of an analogy. So if this were, uh, I'm going to use the analogy of an army. If this were an army, who would it be in the army? The B cells are the ones that produce antibodies. So the B cells get activated when your body recognizes that there is some sort of foreign pathogen there and they will start making antibodies. We know that an antibody's job is to find the pathogens and clump them so that they're easy to get rid of. In my analogy of an army, who would be the B cells? Well, the antibodies are kind of like the weapons. They're the things that we're using to try to f get and injure our enemy. So we would call this maybe the weapon maker or the weapon storage or something that has to do with the weapons. Then you will see there are four cells that all have a T in them. The T generally refers to the thymus gland. Uh, that's part of your lymphatic system where these cells mature. A helper T cell helps so we could say supports B cells and killer T cells. So the two that are on either side of it. If this were an army then, if you can imagine uh, watching a war movie and there's the general and then there's like the guy with him that has the phone that does all of his work. We could call him maybe the sergeant. Then we have the killer T cell. The killer T cell is the one that is actually doing some killing. So the killer T cell destroys the pathogen. So if I was to compare this to an army, maybe I would call this guy the sniper, the one that is actually destroying the enemy. The suppressor T cell is the one that stops the immune response. So you don't want your body to keep fighting an infection when there's no infection there. You would prefer for your resources to be allocated to something that you actually need. So there needs to be an off switch when the pathogen has been destroyed telling your body, hey, we're good. Stop making all these white blood cells. Go back to your normal homeostatic state. This would be, if this was an army, the white flag waiver, the one that says stop, we're done, it's finished, it's over, it's time for peace, the war is done. The memory T cell is a long-lived clone. A memory T cell's job is to be there in case the same pathogen returns. So, your body does not want to have the same pathogen twice. Once you get it once, now your body is sort of primed. It knows which antibodies it has to make to fight this particular pathogen. So a memory T cell is one that lives on even after the immune response is over, so that if you were to get the same pathogen again, you should be ready to fight it. Uh, the memory T cell is one of the sort of base reasons that you would get a vaccination. Getting a vaccination, the point of it usually, is to stimulate your body to be prepared. A vaccination doesn't mean the pathogen will never enter your body. It means that if it does, your immune system is ready to fight it. This, I would say, would be like a spy that we leave behind or perhaps 
if we want to be nicer, the peacekeepers that we leave behind. It's who stays after the war is done to try to make sure that the war doesn't start again.